doing well, that everyone is healthy and keeping safe. And I just want to welcome you once again to another in the Department of Chemistry's Thursday seminar series. This morning, we are bringing you a seminar by Dr. William Irvin, and this is a partnership with the Natural Products Institute here in the Faculty of Science and Technology. I want to welcome especially those colleagues who are joining us from other islands in the Caribbean. Many of you are with us now weekly and we say welcome. I also want to welcome those of you who are joining us from other countries in the world. If you're here for the first time or, you, or if you are a repeating guest, we say welcome. And at this point, I am going to invite Professor Rupika Delgoda to bring the introduction for Dr. William Irving. Prof. Delgoda. Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to our joint seminar presentation this morning from the Department of Chemistry and the Natural Products Institute. Um, and also welcome to our external guests. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker this morning, Dr. William Irvin, who is a structural bioinformatician whose research interests involve the use of molecular modeling and dynamics to uncover novel insight into the structural and dynamic behavior of membrane proteins and oncogenic signaling complexes with the ultimate goal of structure-guided drug design. Dr. Irvin has a PhD in computational biochemistry for which he won the Dean's Award from Massey University, Albany in New Zealand. He has a master's in biochemistry from the same university. He majored in medical biochemistry for his bachelor's from the University of Leeds in England. Along with his own publications and research profile, he has had extensive experience as an editor for MDPI Scientific Publishing House. William is a graduate of Ardane High School and he has returned home. He's a brand new father and has brought his young family home with him. We warmly welcome him as our newest member of staff at the Natural Products Institute. And I now invite him to share his research experiences on painting the picture with molecular dynamics. William. Good morning, everyone. So I'll just share my screen from now. Uh, And I think I may need to rejoin the meeting. One second. Okay, guys, as we wait for Dr. Irvin to rejoin the meeting, let me just remind you that you can post your questions or comments in the chat. Or if you would rather at the end of the presentation by Dr. Irvin, uh, we will invite you to ask your questions and to interact with Dr. Irvin. You will at that time be able to open your microphones and your cameras if you would, if you choose to. I see Dr. Irvin is back. So I'm handing back over to Dr. Irving. Apologies for that. This is my wife's laptop, so I'm not quite used to it. Um, right, so I can share my screen now. Right. That's good, we're seeing now. Okay. Uh, right, so can everyone see that? We're seeing that. I take it everyone else is too. Okay. So good morning, uh, as Professor Delgado mentioned, my name is William Irving. Today, I'll be speaking a bit about molecular modeling and highlighting its various applications throughout the use of a couple of projects. 
So the bulk of this presentation will be related to the characterization of the PI3K oncogenic cell signaling system, but I will also touch on some current research at the end. So I'll start with an overview of molecular modeling before going into a little detail behind the theory of molecular dynamics. So what is molecular modeling? Molecular modeling is essentially the generation, manipulation, or representation of three-dimensional structures of molecules and their associated physical chemical properties. It involves a range of computerized techniques based on theoretical chemistry methods and experimental data to predict molecular and biological properties. It can be done on varying scales using a personal computer or a high performance computing cluster involving multiple CPUs and GPUs. So there are a few different aspects of molecular modeling. For example, molecular dynamics is a simulation method for analyzing the physical movements of atoms and molecules through a period of time. And this allows characterizing the dynamic behavior of the system. Drug docking, for example, allows predicting the preferred orientation of one molecule, which is usually a ligand, to a second molecule, which is usually a protein, when they born, bond to form a stable complex. So the strength of the association can be determined using a scoring function, and this is usually presented as a binding affinity. You also have homology modeling, which is a generation of a novel atomistic 3D structure of a protein on the basis of its amino acid sequence and the structure of a related protein. You have molecular visualization, which is simply the projection of molecular models in various representations, which will become apparent throughout this presentation. Lastly, you have quantum chemistry, which is the application of quantum mechanics to physical models of chemical systems. And this is typically applied towards an understanding of electronic structure. So a lot smaller in scale than molecular dynamics. So I just want to go into a little bit more detail about molecular dynamics. As mentioned previously, molecular dynamics is a study of a system of interacting particles through time using a computer simulation. So this system can involve proteins, RNA, DNA, lipids, ligands, water, other solvents, as long as they have been carefully parameterized. So in an atomistic or fine-grained simulation, each particle typically represents an atom or a small cluster of atoms. For example, one water molecule can be represented as one particle. coarse grain simulations do exist as well, where you can have larger representations, such as entire amino acids constituting one particle. As you can imagine, the computational complexity of the system scales quite drastically with the number of particles, as every possible interaction needs to be considered. The first step of a simulation involves assigning particles Cartesian coordinates, so x, y, and z, which describes their position in the system. Then, initial velocities for these particles are drawn from a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution upon initiation of the simulation. These particles then interact with each other according to the rules laid out in your chosen force field. The simulations described in this talk were done using the Gromos force field, as this was carefully calibrated for proteins and thermodynamics. There are other force fields that exist, however, such as Amber and Charm. Time then moves through the simulation by a short step, which is typically on the scale of a femtosecond or two. And at each step, Newton's equations of motion are integrated. So these interactions occur according to a force field, which essentially describes all possible interactions as a function of bonded terms and non-bonded terms. With regard to the bonded terms, we have bond length, which describes the stretching interaction of two particles, bond angle, which describes the bending interaction of three particles, and bond dihedral, which describes the torsional interaction of four particles. So I don't want to bore you with excessive math. So I've just put the basic equations here describing each term along with a little visualization. So these equations, essentially, they describe the potential energies of each bonded interaction as a function of their deviation from an equilibrium, which is regulated by a force constant, K, except for the dihedral, which is a cosine expansion of that deviation, where the multiplicity term N determines a rotor symmetry. In the force view, this essentially looks something like C bonded with O, has an ideal bond length x, c bonded with o bonded with c, so an ester bond has an ideal bond angle y, and so on. Then you have the non-bonded interactions, which constitute two types. You have van der Waals interactions and electrostatic interactions. 
The first, so Van der Waals, here on the left, described by Lennon Jones approximations with a 12 6 potential, where you have attractive energy at an optimal distance. However, the potential rises steeply at close distances, earlier than that of the Coulombic potential, which then dwarfs any attractive forces and prevents atoms from colliding in your system. At longer distances, the potential tends to zero, which essentially means that the two particles stop seeing each other. Next, you have the electrostatic interactions on the right here, which are described using a standard Coulombic potential, with the strength of which is a function of the particle charges Q and the distance between them R. Now to save computational power, cutoffs are typically applied for each of these terms. Within this cutoff, you calculate them explicitly using these two equations. And outside of this cutoff, you either don't calculate them or you approximate them using simpler methods. So that's enough uh, on the theory of molecular dynamics. So I'm just going to speak a little about phosphoenostide 3-kinase or PI3K, which is the main system that I'm going to talk about today. So this diagram illustrates the PI3K pathway, which mediates the downstream regulation of all these blue boxes down here via other pathways such as AKT or protein kinase C. So it works in tandem with P10 by phosphorylating and dephosphorylating phosphatidylinostide bisphosphate or PIP2 and phosphatidylinostide trisphosphate or PIP3. So essentially, PI3K is a kinase and P10 is a phosphatase. So all these signaling pathways linked to PI3K regulate factors such as cell growth, proliferation, and survival. And this is all regulated by the phosphorylation and dephosphorylation of PIP2 and PIP3 in tandem with P10 at the cell membrane interface. As you can imagine, hyperactivation of PI3K alpha is implicated in cancer development as it will lead to increased cell growth proliferation and survival. It is a protein which consists of two subunits. So you have P110-alpha, which is a catalytic subunit, and P85-alpha, which is a regulatory subunit. PIK3CA, which is the gene encoding P110-alpha, has been identified as an oncogene. And mutations in this gene lead to mutations in the protein, which commonly occur at two hotspots. You have E545K in the helical domain, which increases activity by uncoupling some of the inhibitory contacts with P85-alpha. But this variant is still dependent on RAS activation. And then you have H1047R in the kinase domain, which increases activity by improving membrane affinity, which then renders the enzyme independent of RAS activation. These two mutations improve activity through different mechanisms, so they are synergistic in their behavior. However, as the focus of this talk is on the PIPK membrane interaction, I will only be contrasting the behavior of the wild type enzyme and the H1047R mutant. So the first step before initiating a molecular dynamic simulation is to construct the system. The primary components in this case are the PIPK enzyme and the lipid membrane. So you typically start with a crystal structure of a protein, in this case, the PIPK enzyme, and all the missing residues in the crystal structure for the P1 and alpha catalytic subunit were modeled in, and the P85 alpha inhibitory subunit was restricted to the inter-SH2 domain only. And this was done to avoid the inhibitory contacts of the SH2 domain. So here, for P1 and alpha in green, you have the adapter binding domain, which is responsible for maintaining contact with the P85 alpha subunit. You have in blue, as its name suggests, the RAS binding domain, which is responsible for binding the RAS protein for subsequent activation. In yellow, behind here, you have the C2 domain, which is proposed to be involved in membrane binding as in other C2 domain containing proteins. In gray, you have the helical domain, the function of which does remain a mystery, but in other PI3K isoforms, it's involved in binding to other kinases. Lastly, in red, you have the kinase or the catalytic domain, which is responsible for this PIP2 to PIP3 phosphorylation. And it is split into an N lobe and a C lobe or a C terminal and an N terminal lobe. And these two exhibit twisting and pincer-like motion with the binding pocket located in between them. On the other hand, for P85 alpha, only the SH2 domain functions are known, where the NSH2 domain binds to the helical domain to inhibit P1 alpha activity, 
and the C terminal SH2 domain binds to the RAS binding domain, preventing its activation by RAS. As I've mentioned, only the inter SH2 domain, which is shown in pink here, was retained, as it plays a scaffold like role in maintaining the PIPK structure. On the other hand, you have the lipid membrane. So this membrane was built separately from scratch. It was parametrized and simulated to validate its properties before being added to the system. It contained phosphatidylcholine, phosphatidylethanolamine, phosphatidylserine, sphingomyelin, and cholesterol, as well as the all-important phosphatidylinoxide bisphosphate. And the composition shown here was that which was used. This uh, composition is reflective of the inner leaflet of a membrane, which is a site of PI3K, and it's reflective of a brain lipid membrane, which was used to generate the experimental data by our collaborators. So once you create your system, the simulation trajectory looks a bit like this. So in this presentation, I have removed the water and the ions for clarity, but the membrane is shown here in gray, the wild type PI3K is shown in red, and the H1047R mutant is shown in blue. So these two structures were identical prior to energy minimization and simulation initiation, with the exception of the point mutation at point 1047. Despite what may seem a minor difference, these two proteins proceeded through the simulation in a different manner. So on the left here, the wild type approached and interacting with the membrane, presenting a rather offset orientation but the HM47R mutant also approached and interacted with the membrane, presenting a much flatter orientation. So I'll just play that again. So they both interacted with the membrane at roughly the same point, but the wild type does not collapse onto the membrane, while the HM47R does, presenting a flat orientation. So this is just a uh, another representation of the same simulation as a time series instead of as a video trajectory. And I just want to remind you of the position of the kinase domain where you have the N lobe on the left and the C lobe on the right. And as you can see, in the case of the h 47 r mutant, the binding pocket is well presented. But in the wild type, it's slightly offset due to the N lobe of the kinase domain failing to sufficiently interact with the membrane. So this is a stage here where you can now link molecular dynamic simulations to, exist, to existing experimental data. And this allows not only validating the simulations themselves, but it also provides insight into the experimental findings. So this is some hydrogen deuterium exchange data of the wild type and the hn 47 rp 3 k carried out by John Burke from the Roger Williams group. So hydrogen deuterium exchange essentially works by deuterating hydrogens in the amide on the protein backbone where the rate of deuteration is dependent on solvent exposure. After a predetermined time, you can cut up the pep protein into peptides before undergoing mass spectrometry to test the level of deuteration. While this is not really atomistic insight, it does give a general picture of the solvent exposure of the system. So below here, you have the hydrogen return exchange data that they generated. And above, you have the final two snapshots of the two systems colored according to their scale. So as you can see from the light blue and dark blue colored peptides in the h and 47 r variant on the right upon membrane binding, there was reduced deuteration along the kinase domain. And these peptide fragments labeled here are actually an accurate representation of the PI3K membrane binding domains. You can also see that this reduced deuteration is far more evident for the h and 47 r structure on the right than it is for the wild type structure on the left. What this is essentially telling us is that the HN47R mutant has the ability to improve its membrane affinity by increasing the presentation of these membrane binding domains. However, the wild type enzyme may need some help to achieve this orientation, maybe through RAS activation. Because remember, the HN47R mutant, its activity is independent of RAS. So continuing with these membrane binding domains, we have membrane binding domain one, which is in the N lobe of the kinase domain, and membrane binding domains two and three, which are located in the C lobe of the kinase domain. The WIF motif, or tryptophan isoleucine phenylalanine motif, is located in the C terminal tail, and it is proposed to insert into the membrane, serving as a kind of anchor. So here, 
is a graphical representation of the distance between each membrane binding domain and the membrane throughout the course of the simulation of each variant. On the right here, as you can see, all domains in the case of HN47R approached and eventually interacted with the membrane. However, in the wild type, membrane binding domain one, shown in black, never achieved membrane interaction, which prevented the end lobe of the kinase domain from collapsing onto the membrane, so to speak. And this prevented the full presentation of the binding pocket. So again, this keeps coming back to the wild type potentially needing more help to achieve this orientation. If I go back to the structure showing the domains, you can see that the positions of the N lobe and the C lobe of the kinase domain. Now, interestingly, the RAS binding domain is alongside the N lobe. So RAS activation may actually involve an improvement in affinity around this N lobe, which would allow binding of membrane binding domain one and allowing eventual catalysis. However, hn 47 r circumvents this necessity by indirectly improving the membrane affinity of PI3K through conformation changes. So this is a zoomed in view of some snapshots from the simulation showing the membrane interaction of each membrane binding domain for the two variants. So again, you have wild type in red on the left and hn 47 r in blue on the right. Membrane binding domain one is not included in the wild type snapshots as mentioned before, it never interacted. A recurring theme among, along all these membrane binding domains is a close interaction of a basic residue, so a lysine, with phosphatidylserine, which is an anionic lipid. Furthermore, you have the hydrophobicity of the whiff motif for both cases, which allowed the C-terminal tail to embed into the membrane. And this is actually a common feature across membrane proteins, C-terminal tail embedment, that is. So this is an overall view of the PI3K membrane interface for the HN47R variant. You have the C2 domain in yellow, the inter-SH2 domain in blue, and the kinase domain in red. This interface features a very high number of basic residues, so lysines and arginines. In fact, over 40% of the residues along this interface are basic. So we have the C2 domain, which as previously mentioned, is typically involved in membrane binding across various membrane proteins. You have the kinase domain in red, which is expectedly involved in the membrane activation, interaction, sorry. And the two domains are separated by this coiled coil inter SH2 domain. Now, interestingly, this inter SH2 domain has a basic residue at the top of each of these helix turns. If we take a closer look at the basic residues involved in the kinase domain, we have these polybasic membrane binding domains one to three, which were previously highlighted as well as the C-terminal tail residues either side of the whiff motif. And finally, we have the activation loop, which is actually the site of substrate recognition in PI3K. So all in all, we expect that this is a very good representation of what, would, what, what one would imagine the catalytic orientation of PI3K looks like with respect to the membrane. So here's a distance graph of each of those three domains with respect to the membrane. As you can see, the kinase domain, shown this time in blue, interacts first, followed by the protein collapsing onto the membrane, bringing the ISH2 and C2 domains into play and presenting the binding pocket. Throughout this process, the number of hydrogen bonds, shown here in light blue, between the protein and membrane increases. So again, this is just a representation of the PI3K membrane interface that was achieved in the simulation. Quite clearly, you have polybasic membrane loops and anionic lipids involved in the interaction. So continuing with this theme of an interaction between basic residues and anionic lipids, which is commonly seen across membrane proteins, I just want to briefly show some published work describing a screening method, which I coded for proteins with respect to a membrane. And this takes into consideration the electrostatic nature of their interaction. Essentially, what this method does is constrain the membrane coordinates while rotating the protein coordinates along pitch roll and yaw axes. And this allows adequately sampling all potential protein membrane interfaces at a chosen protein membrane distance. Then a short simulation is run for each orientation and the interaction energies between the protein and membrane are calculated. The output looks like a cube 
where each orientation is depicted as one block. And you can then pull out your coordinates of your desired orientation. So in this case, the dark blue orientation, which is the most favorable, and look at it. When applied to PI3K, this method identified the most favorable orientation as this one here picture to the right, where once again, you have this interface with the membrane binding domains shown in orange, which might be a little hard to see, but you have these membrane binding domains coming into play. Using this method, you can even go one step further and identify this membrane interaction on the basis of individual residues. You can then find that just a few of these 1,200 plus residues account for over 50% of the electrostatic interaction with very high negative numbers, with the vast majority of the residues contributing very little. This then allows pinpointing the most important residues for membrane interaction, which I won't go too much into because that's confidential. But as you can imagine, targeting of these residues may allow abrogating any PI3K hyperactivity seen due to the HM47 mutation, which would then allow bringing it in line with a wild type and removing the associated increased cell proliferation, which is a hallmark of cancer. So these are some more examples of outputs of the best orientation when applied to various systems. So this is the wild type PI3K on the left and the HN47R in green on the right. As you can see, according to this method, these two variants have similar orientations or similar best orientations. However, according to the simulations, it would appear that the wild type does not have the required potential to collapse onto the membrane, which is instead achievable by, achievable by HN47R due to its instigation of conformational change, which results in an improved electrostatic surface, especially alongside membrane manning domain one and the end lobe of the kinase domain. When this kind of screening is instead done with that plain uncharged membrane without anionic lipids, the results are quite stark. And this orientation seen here on the left is not seen among the top outputs for the plain uncharged membrane. The top orientation for the plain uncharged membrane instead only presents a C2 domain, which is actually quite interesting considering its known function in other proteins. So I just want to move on to another piece of cool analysis you can apply to an MD simulation. And this is called potential of mean force. And this allows approximating the binding free energy of two components. It's typically applied to protein ligand interactions where you slowly pull the ligand away from the protein, which is actually fairly easy because the ligand is a small molecule. However, I wanted to apply this to the PI3K membrane interaction to quantify the difference between the wild type and the HN47 interaction, which as you can imagine, was a bit more complicated and a lot more computationally expensive. As far as I know, something like this has never been done before. So the first step of PMF is to gener generate equally spaced configurations, pulling the protein away from the membrane. This then allows carrying out umbrella sampling, where each configuration overlaps to allow for an approximation of the binding free energy at each distance. So the orientation of the two variants, wild type and HM47R, for this PMF analysis was chosen from the screening method. So these two orientations here in purple and green. What the screening method did was essentially consider all orientational sampling, identifying the best orientation, while PMF then considered the membrane affinity along the path in this orientation only. A potential of mean force curve can then be constructed using weighted histogram analysis, where the change in free energy of binding is the difference between the minimum and the maximum points of the curve when it plateaus. This is then related to the dissociation constant through the equation delta G equals RT ln KD. As you can see, HN47R presents more than a doubly favorable change in the free energy of binding, which quantifies its higher affinity with respect to the wild type. Right, so that's all the membrane association part of the PI3K stuff. But I just want to wrap up by looking at the substrate interaction specifically. So this on the left here is a snapshot of the HN47R variant around one third of the way into the simulation when the kinase domain first makes contact with the PIP2 substrate shown here in green. As mentioned previously, this initial substrate recognition is carried out by the activation loop, specifically arginine at position 949, 
at this stage of the simulation, you have a water-mediated hydrogen bonding network, which was identified, where the phosphate group, shown here on the right more clearly, interacts with the arginine side chain via two water molecules. Interestingly, at this point of the interaction in the simulation, HN47R was also in an offset orientation with respect to the membrane. And it is following this substrate recognition that it collapsed onto the membrane, so to speak. This is another chance to compare it to some experimental data where there is a crystal structure solved by Michelle Miller with PI3K in complex with the PIP2 head group only without the PIP2 tails. So what I did was I superimposed her structure with my simulation structure and I generated a root mean square deviation profile between the identified substrate in my simulation and the substrate in her crystal structure. So the graph here shows that at the start of the simulation, the two PIP2s are far away as expected with the protein being far away from the membrane. However, throughout the simulation, it eventually gets to a point where the two substrates are within approximately eight angstroms of each other. So on the top right, you have Michelle's crystal structure with the PIP2 shown in red. And on the bottom right, you have the final snapshot of my hn 40 r simulation, where you can see the PIP2 head group interacting with the same residues that she identified experimentally. So of particular note, I want to point out a, a lysine at position 776 here, which is located in the P loop or the phosphate binding loop, which was identified as key in catalysis through mutagenesis studies. So just to reiterate here, you have arginine 949 in the C loop of the kinase domain, which is important for substrate recognition, and then lysine 776 in the N loop of the kinase domain, which is important for substrate catalysis. And these two lobes, in between them, you have the binding pocket where the PIP2 eventually ends up as shown in these two images on the right. So just to recap, I just want to present an overview of the key points that I've highlighted throughout this PI3K data with my proposed theory behind its interaction with the membrane, which was derived from this molecular dynamic simulation and the various analysis tools I applied. So first, you have the coulombic forces between the polybasic membrane binding domains and the anionic lipids, which determines PI3K's catalytically competent orientation with respect to the membrane, where you have the C2 domain, the inter-SH2 domain, and the kinase domain presented as an interface. HN47R is able to increase the PI3K membrane affinity through initiating conformational changes, which improve the electrostatic surface potential, particularly around the end lobe of the kinase domain, which then negates the need for rust activation. You then have an initial substrate recognition carried out by arginine 949, which ensures that the enzyme binds at the correct site on the membrane, with the C-terminal tail and WIF motif embedding into the membrane, anchoring the enzyme in place. This is then followed by a collapse onto the membrane, which presents the binding pocket flanked by the activation loop on one side in the C-lobe and the phosphate binding loop on the other side in the N-lobe, which allows the catalytic lysine at position 776 to interact with PIP2. And that's basically the overview of what I think, based on these molecular dynamic simulations, how PI3K interacts with the membrane. Just one last slide I want to show you on this note is a proposed binding site of RAS to the RAS binding domain in PI3K. Now, this was solved in a crystal structure by Michael Packold, but that was done for the gamma isoform of PI3K with the RAS C terminal tail missing. So following a structure and sequence alignment of the alpha and gamma isoforms, I determined the potential binding location, which I've demonstrated here using the wild type structure from the simulation. So the RAS is shown in green alongside the RAS binding domain and the end lobe of the kinase domain. So this is purely to show the plausibility of RAS activation, in fact, improving membrane affinity around this end lobe of the kinase domain which would allow the wild type to achieve a similar orientation to the H1047R variant, where the missing RAS-C terminal tail would also embed into the membrane, providing another anchor point. So this necessity has been shown to be overcome by the H1047R mutation through an intrinsic improvement in PI3K's membrane affinity. Right, so that's it for PI3K. And before I wrap up, I just want to move on to another system I worked on which involves cytochrome P450 enzymes. So these enzymes belong to a superfamily of heme proteins 
which are primarily found in the liver and digestive tract, but there are even recent reports of them being found in the brain. They are found in all kingdoms of life, and they function as oxidases, which catalyze a series of metabolic reactions. But they are also involved in the biosynthesis of sterols, for example, cholesterol in humans or ergosterol in fungi. And this makes them a common target site for antifungal me medications. So the isoforms is a xenobiotic metabolism role are typically found in the endoplasmic reticulum of the cell, whereas those involved in sterile biosynthesis are typically found in the mitochondria. And these enzymes, cytochrome P450s, represent a major factor in drug design and discovery. Because of all the enzymes involved in drug metabolism around the body, over 70% are accounted for by cytochrome P450s within phase one of metabolism with them being responsible for the clearance of at least 50% of drugs ingested into the human body. So as you can imagine, their mutation can lead to a buildup of toxins in the body, and they're also commonly overexpressed in cancers. So my previous modeling work involved atomistic molecular dynamic simulations of a yeast CYP51 enzyme embedded in a lanostrol and phosphatidylcholine membrane with and without a lanostrol substrate bound in the active site. The aim here was to characterize the nature of CYP51's interaction with the membrane, as well as its effect on the active site, highlighting the differences when the substrate was present and absent. What the simulation allowed me to identify was the dynamics of the lanostrol substrate, particularly as it relates to the proposed entry and egress tunnels identified in the CYP51 structure. So the top image is a simulation snapshot showing the enzyme bound to the membrane through its transmembrane helix with the binding cavity in gold, the heme group in red, and the substrate in green highlighted. On the other hand, these bottom images here show a more zoomed out view, highlighting instead the positions of the substrate entry and egress tunnels. So as you can see on the left here, the entry tunnel in pink is linked to the membrane, providing a path to the heme catalytic site, while the egress tunnel on the right in gold points away from the membrane, likely toward another enzyme in the chain, which would be bound alongside C51. What the simulation also highlighted that is that depending on whether alanosterol is present or absent in the active site, the entry and egress tunnels were either open or closed. So the entry tunnel was closed, but the egress tunnel was open when the substrate was in the active site, but when the substrate was absent from the active site, the egress tunnel on the other hand was closed, while the entry tunnel was open. So this leads into some of the work which I started here at NPI, which has primarily involved looking at the inhibitory mechanisms of CYP1A1, 1A2, and 1B1 when presented with various naturally occurring compounds. As mentioned previously, these enzymes are commonly found overexpressed in cancers. And one of the goals at NPI is to search for compounds with potentially chemo-preventative properties in alignment with this global shift toward the use of natural substances in medicine. So the compounds for which I've obtained drug docking data so far are procyanidin beta-2, artocarpin, and dibenzyl trisulfide. And these figures show their proposed binding sites with the residues key for their binding shown in blue, giving hints towards their mechanistic approach to inhibition. For example, here on the right, in the most favorable binding mode identified, Dibenzyl trisulfide exhibits an edge to phase pi pi stacking interaction with phenylalanine at position 123 of CYP1A1. And this is actually a common feature of many of CYP1A1's inhibitors. So, all in all, this seminar was simply an attempt to show that, in conjunction with in vitro and in vivo data, in silico data can be used to characterize molecular interactions on otherwise impossible scales. These molecular interactions can involve proteins, RNA, DNA, membranes, ligands, and more. And you can characterize these in a coarse grain manner where multiple atoms or molecules are represented by a single particle or a fine grain manner at an atomistic scale or even smaller. So the resolution of the characterization and the size of the system depend on two things. You have parameterization of the system components without which the system cannot be simulated and then you have the computational power. So whether you're using a personal computer or a high performance computing cluster with hundreds and thousands of cores, 
which would allow you to generate bigger systems with more components. Depending on the goal of the project, this can either lead to an understanding of inhibitory and catalytic mechanisms or an identification of binding sites and important residue ligand interactions with the goal of optimizing drug discovery and development. So thank you everyone for listening and I hope that was insightful. I just want to give a final shout out to all the funding bodies that sponsored this research. And I'm now happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Irvin, for uh, a detailed and stimulating talk. And at the end of that, I can say all of us here in the FSD are excited that you're a part of the team. And I am opening the floor now for questions. Are there any questions from the floor? You may put your hand up and you will be acknowledged or comments. Okay, I guess I can I can ask mine. So so Dr. Irvin, I am I make new materials and I am I have always had an interest in um, in in modeling and using that to to guide the structure function relationships that I look right. that I look for, but I really haven't done any of it, and I and I and I only know a little bit. So forgive me if my question is a little bit. Um, Young, I, I just want to know about um, ab initio calculations and if the molecular dynamics sim simulations that you do um, have underlying potentials that can be derived, that are derived from ab initio calculations, because that certainly would be useful for me. Right. So if you're looking at an individual molecule, for example, a tiny compound that you've generated from scratch, that's typically where you'd use quantum chemistry or quantum mechanics to look at the, the um, electron surface and the different interaction that it can occur to make sure that you have a correct representation of the compound. Mm -hmm. So you want to apply that to a molecular dynamic simulation to look at its broader uh, performance with respect to other components, for example, a protein, then that's where you use molecular dynamics, but only after parameterizing it carefully. And parameterization through quantum mechanics is a completely different step where you assign, for example, uh, bond orders and certain bond lengths to that um, component before inputting it into a molecular dynamic simulation. But that is a part of modeling, yes. Okay, and you have the capacity to, to do that? Yes, quantum chemistry, yes. Okay, sir, that is my question and we shall be speaking some more, I am sure. Are there any comments or questions from the floor. I have Doc, Professor Kaur, Professor Daniel Kaur. Go right uh, ahead, Prof. Uh, thank you, Chair. But I think um, maybe you should take Prof Mulder's question first. It's in the chat. It was there before me. Aha, thank you. I, I must have looked on the chat. Uh, let me just look on that. Okay, Prof Mulder's question is, how was the role of water and small ions accounted for in the simulations? Right, so in molecular dynamic simulations, depending on what force field you're using, for example, Gromos, Amber, or Charm, water is accounted for by different systems. In Charm and Gromos, you use a tip three water molecule system where the water molecule is represented as one particle. So you don't have the hydrogen and the oxygen represented differently, it's just one particle. Um, and each of those has been carefully parameterized by the developers of the force field to interact in a way that water molecules do. For the ions in the system, it was they were used to counterbalance the overall charge of the system. So because of the anionic nature of the membrane, a series of sodium and chloride ions were added to the system to just balance the overall charge. And that's done at the initiation stage of the membrane uh, molecular dynamic simulation. So you add your protein and your membrane in a box, then you populate it with water molecules where there is no protein or membrane, and then you add your ions to balance the charge in the system. And then that goes through several energy minimization and initiation processes using NPT and NBT ensembles. So that means either maintaining the pressure or the volume and slowly getting your overall system 
to the specific temperature that you're going to be doing the simulations at and doing it in a way slowly so that you don't break the system, so to speak. Okay, and Professor Kaur, back to you. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, so you have to forgive me um, because some of that biochemistry is not where I normally would read. But um, so what was curious to me is that the when you're talking about the 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 enzyme that will, you know, do the conversion between the PIP2 and PIP3, um, the wild type versus the mutated type. Uh, what, you're, what you're showing is that mutated type has a better alignment with the membrane. And it right. seems like that's a good thing. Um, yeah. So what occurred to me is, why is it that if the wild type is the unmutated one, the one that is supposedly what is natural in the body, um, what is it that's causing that alignment? I would imagine that the, the alignment with the membrane ought to be, in fact, what we're seeing the, the mutated one doing. The mutated, yeah. And so there, is there something else that normally would cause the wild type to align better? And in right. that circumstance, shouldn't the simulation then be looking at those that environmental condition to compare the um, mutated version with? I just kind of trying to understand, because um, right now your simulations are showing that the mutated one should be better. And I'm yes. just, you know, I presume it's not. No, it is. So basically, the PI3K goes through several methods of inhibition or activation throughout its process in catalysis. So you have the SH2 domains, which I mentioned on the P85 alpha inhibitory subunit, which are bound to the, um, to the catalytic subunit usually. And for initiation, you need to first remove those SH2 domains from interaction. Then you need to get help from RAS activation to bring the protein towards the membrane where it binds at the site of the, um, at the, site of the substrate. You have C-terminal tail, which can either be in a closed or open orientation. When it's in an open orientation, it allows access to the binding pocket and it allows binding or embedding into the membrane. Then you have substrate recognition by arginine 949 and then catalysis by uh, lysine 776. What this is essentially saying is that um, the HM47 mutant is able to interact with the membrane without RAS activation. And the goal was to understand how it does that. And the finding was that it does that by improving membrane um, affinity, which allows it to achieve this orientation without the help of RAS, which was not included in the simulation. So wild type, I assume if it was simulated with RAS, but there are no crystal structures for that, that it would interact with the membrane as seen in the HM47R. It just needs that help while HM47R doesn't. I if see. That answers I see. the question. It, it definitely does. Thank you very much. Okay. okay, we have another question in the chat, Dr. Irvin. This is from Garfield Williams. Garfield is one of our PhD students in the Department of Chemistry. He asks, have you ever looked at the simulation of biocatalytic reactions involving cytochrome P450 enzymes in fungi? Right, so that last uh, part of the talk where it was um, the C450, so isoform 51 in a membrane with an nostril was to characterize the membrane interaction and the substrate interaction of C51 where lanosterol is a substrate where it's turned into ergosterol in fungi. And that's the basis for, for example, itraconazole and fluconazole in their um, catalytic mechanisms. And that's kind of the approach to of these antifungal medications. So the goal there was to kind of understand how lanosterol affects the conformation of the CIP450 uh, CIP enzyme and how that can be exploited in terms of new drugs. One thing that molecular dynamic simulations can't do is exhibit any kind of electron shift or the actual catalytic mechanism. So for example, you would never be able to see the lanosterol get um, hydrolyzed within the active site. You would just be able to look at the dynamics of it before it interacts with the heme group, for example. So I can show you the position of the lanosterol within the active site or outside of the active site. I can show you the lanosterol getting into the active site. I can show you the conformational changes of the enzyme with respect to lanosterol being in the active site or being bound to the membrane or not. But I can't actually show you the biocatalytic mechanism of it. I can only assume based on the findings, anything to do with biocatalytic mechanisms would have to come from 
um, in vitro or in vivo data. Okay, thank you, Dr. Irvin. We do have some more time in the room. Okay, I see. I see Prof. Reese. I'm going to go Prof. Reese and then come back to you, Dr. Kaur. Prof. Reese, please go ahead. All right. Um, thank you, Dr. Irvin, for, for your talk. I, I just wanted to ask a question. Well, first of all, um, Garfield, who just asked the question, is one of my students. And I, I will want to meet with you sometime to talk about P450s. But uh, the, the question I have right now has to do with the earlier part of your talk on the uh, kinase. Uh, yeah. You indicated that, uh, you know, depending on how much of the protein was exposed, uh, you know, that, that would show, sorry, the amount of deuterium exchange, deuterium labeling that occurred right. with you, uh, how much of the protein was exposed. But as far as I could see, you were able to determine that over time. And, and you, you said you were using mass spec to, uh, to, you know, to do the analysis. I wasn't, I was just wondering if this is done in solution, how, how do you determine you know, uh, how much deuteration occurs over time. And, and right. there, there was a second part to it. Should I wait or? Up to, to you. Or, or should I give you the second part right now? You can go ahead, I'll remember. Okay, good. Because I have a terrible memory when it comes to uh, two questions. Okay, um, I, I just wondered, you also indicated in some cases, I, I think where the exchange had taken place and I, I was really curious to know what experiment can be done to determine, you know, not, not what portion of the uh, peptide, but, but actually you know, which individual amino acid. Yeah. Those are my questions. Thank you. Okay. So the hydrogen deuterium exchange stuff was done by collaborators. So it's not quite my field of expertise, but I'll do my best to explain it. So essentially what you do is you have either the wild type or the HM47 in simulation in solution and you deuterate it for let's say five minutes. After that time period, you cut up the protein into peptides, you undergo mass spec, and you check the level of deuteration of these peptide fragments. You can then repeat this experiment where instead of putting it in solution, you put it in solution along with micelles. And then in the process of activation of this enzyme and the micelles binding, then you can repeat the deuteration experiment. And then that tells you again, which, um, which amino acids or which peptides were more deuterated or not. Then you can compare the deuteration level of the acids, amino acids before or in the presence of the micelles and in the absence of the micelles. And what that allows you to say is that when HM47 or wild type is in the presence of the micelles, these particular peptide fragments show either increased deuteration or decreased deuteration as a result of the membrane um, interaction. So for the case of HM47R, all along that interface with the kinase domain, when you compared it in solution and in the presence of micelles, those showed decreased deuteration. So they were no longer exposed to solvent, they were instead exposed to the micelles. So that allowed you to tell, okay, these um, amino acids are instead exposed to the membrane or they are responsible for membrane binding. And then you just repeat it with PI3K and I'm sorry, with a wild type in HM47R. And then the difference tells you well, these are more exposed in HM47R compared to wild type or less exposed. And that kind of shows you an idea of the conformation changes on the, that the protein has undergone, which has allowed these membrane binding domains to be more presented. Well, the second part of your question, that's why I mentioned that it wasn't really atomistic insight, but it gives a general picture of the situation because the peptide fragments are neither uniform in the, in the number of amino acids, or in their size. So they just know that the fragment is 10 amino acids long or 15 amino acids long, and they know that this fragment has either more or less deuteration based on the mass spec. So it doesn't quite give you um, the individual residues which are involved. But again, that's why I keep coming back to this. Molecular dynamic simulations allow you to get to a level of insight or a level of resolution that is not available in some experiments. And by contrasting the simulations with this deuterium exchange data, not only am I validating the orientation that I found in the simulation as being correct because the same interface is presented, but then I can also use the simulation to look at the individual residues and point back to the deuterium exchange data and tell them, well, look, you said that residues 848 to 859 were exposed to the membrane. I'm telling you that yes, they're exposed to the membrane and it's residue 860 or 8, 
52 specifically that is responsible for this membrane interaction, which happens in most cases to be a basic residue interacting with an anionic lipid. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I'm not asking more questions. I'm just going to make a comment. I, I didn't realize that once the deuterium had gone on to the, um, the nitrogen of the amide, I, I thought it would come off very quickly. I didn't realize you could actually you know, do, you, know, you cut the protein and, and, and analyze it upwards by mass spec. Uh, I, didn't, I thought the exchange uh, back uh, to the uh, protonated uh, form would have been much faster. Right, but thank you very much. So just to comment on that, as far as I understand, when it deuterates the side chains, it goes on and comes off really easily. And when it's the carboxyl group in the backbone, it goes on and comes off really or too slowly. And using the amide allowed them to have a time scale, which was kind of easy to, I guess, look at the uh, deuteration of the protein itself. I can look back at the um, at their paper and get back to you on the specifics on the time frame and stuff like that. All right, thank you. No problem. Okay, Dr. Kaur, you have the final one. Oh, thank you, Chair. Um, this question was about the choice that seemed an arbitrary one, and maybe you could clarify. You said on the potential functions for the Van der Waals forces and the Coulombic forces, that potential right. as it approaches zero goes to infinity. So at some point you have to for computational purposes, make a yeah. call. Um, what's the basis of that call? Is there is there some other parameters that affect that? Is that an arbitrary choice? And how does that impact the outcomes or the predictions that the, the simulations give you? So this is just to specify, for example, looking at a Coulombic potential, if you, let's say, have a residue and a lipid, and they're within a certain distance, what determines that distance as to whether they're calculated explicitly or implicitly? Right, right. In other words, at some point, you're going to have to make a, a cutoff that says, well, I will not allow that potential to go to, right. so you know, beyond, for example, beyond the error, the error capabilities of the, of the, computation, the computer, right? If right, right. There's going to be a limit to how much you can represent. So I, I just wondered what's the basis for that choice and whether there is any, whether you know how that might impact the, the, the predictions that are happening. Because, of course, there are millions and millions of interactions exactly. being simulated right. so those errors will potentially accumulate if they don't if they're not controlled in some way right so this is typically determined by the force field you choose and those who parameterize the force field on a mathematical level uh, for example in the force field i chose coulombic potentials are explicitly calculated within 10 angstroms and then implicitly calculated within 20 angstroms and then not calculated at all outside of 20 angstroms within 10 angstroms you'd use this uh equation within 20 angstroms you use an algorithm that was created by Ewald called the practical mesh Ewald which essentially uses a grid instead of individual atoms and it says how do these grid blocks interact with each other in terms of a favorable or an unfavorable Coulombic interaction and then beyond that they're just not calculated at all. I assume that in the development of the force field itself they realize that whether these calculations were done or not did not affect the results to a level where it was worth including them in the calculation. Because if you imagine you have a grid of two nanometers by two nanometers, you may have three residues, 10 water molecules, and a lipid molecule within that space, which when you break it down to an atomistic level, you have hundreds of carbons, hundreds of hydrogens, hundreds of oxygens. And you then need to consider based on the point charges on each of these atoms, what the specific um, interaction between each atom is whether it's a favorable or an unfavorable Coulomb interaction and as well is it a favorable Van der Waals or unfavorable Van der Waals interaction and then you need to compute these every two femtoseconds so if you can imagine with a large enough system with enough water molecules and so on that if you try to calculate all of these stuff at every time step if unless you had a simulation the size of 10 components it would take you six months to to simulate one nanosecond of a system which obviously is not worth doing so the common um criteria in molecular dynamic simulations is how big of a system can you simulate as accurately as possible where actually if you had just waited six months for improved computational facilities you could have just simulated it in a lesser time to achieve the same result 
for example, if today I can simulate something with a hundred components in six months, then, but in six months, I can simulate that same hundred component system in one month because of improved computational devices, then I've just wasted my time. Mm -hmm. So the idea is to find that balance between accuracy and, and um, I guess, how much you can simulate. Mm -hmm. Yes, I understand. I, I was just thinking that uh, those models would have made assumptions about the yes. number of interacting part particles. And yes. so that may come in to a particular specific simulation that you're trying to do. I was just trying to see how that calibration process happens. And in your case, whether you could just rely on the underlying model for the force field, or if you had to tweak it yourself for the particular um, simulations that you're doing. Right, but, so in this case, yeah. because of the force field I use, which was specifically parameterized for thermodynamics and proteins, I did not tweak them. Right. But if okay. I were to use another force field, which was kind of more aimed at RNA or DNA, then it would probably have a different uh, right. cutoff for that purpose. Right. Thank you very much. But right, I right, can right. also choose to calculate them explicitly if I wanted. It would just take forever. Take long, exactly. No, uh, yeah, I, I understand. Thank you very much. Okay. That was a no very, problem. very insightful talk. The, the support that you get from the, from certainly from those crystal structures um, might also guide that those decisions, I suppose. Okay. The resolution of the crystal structure, yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, everyone, I'm sure you are going to join me wherever you are. And with a round of applause, a big thank you to Dr. Irvin. A, a, a welcome home, Dr. Irvin, a welcome home. Clearly, you have seen there is wide interest and the faculty um, is, is celebrating the added potential, you know, the, the opportunities that you, that you bring. Um, to, to all of us and, and to the research that we all do. So we are all looking forward across all departments in the faculty to working with you. You clearly will have your hands full and, and we look forward to some, some tangible um, products. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you all for joining us this morning. I thank not only the research staff in the Department of Chemistry and the MPI, but also the administrative staff at NPI in the Department of Chemistry and in the faculty office. I want to thank especially uh, Terry, Terry and Collins. Um, we really appreciate the support that you give to us. Everyone, please stay safe and join us again next week when we continue our Thursday seminar series. Dr. Irvin, all the best to you. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone for listening.